Pagela Kasla. Greetings. My name is Tom Seawood. This is my partner Peggy, and we're from the Pacific Northwest. And uh, I'm a member of the Kwakwakiwak Nation from northeastern Vancouver Island, British Columbia, Canada. And Peggy lives in Seattle. Uh, there was a scheduling mishap where we were on the schedule for today on the paper, but we weren't supposed to perform today. But they said to come up here for 10 or 15 minutes. So we'll give you a brief about what we do. So Peggy and I have been together for almost 11 years. and. She came on a zebra striped kayak into an abandoned native village with fallen totem poles lying on the ground, ancient big house beam structures from the traditional homes of my people. And it's a very famous site known as Mama Lala Kula, village of a last potlatch. And we had a pole lying on the ground with a grizzly bear with paws sticking up. And on the paws were carved two faces with hollow eyes and puckered up lips and that represents Jonahwa. Jonahwa is my people's name for the Sasquatch or Bigfoot. Some of you might have heard about our people from northeastern Vancouver Island who call the Sasquatch Bukwus. It's incorrect. Bukwus is a small little hair covered bipedal creature that Peggy danced on the stage last night and it's supposed to be the keeper of the ghost world and it's very lonely. So when you out in the forest and you're investigating for Bigfoot and all of a sudden you find yourself twisted and you're lost. Pretty soon you're out of food, you're out of water, you start to panic and you start to run and you can't find where you came from and you're getting all afraid, you're getting darkness comes and you're getting hungry and you get tired and you go to sleep. Well that little bukwus has been watching you and following you and he knows you're in this weakened state and you'll give in to temptation. And when you wake up, you see a platter, a piece of bark, and on it are beautiful, delectable foods from your region, what you're used to eating. And you're starving, you're scared, you're cold, and you start devouring that food. But Wuss starts to chatter, making his little chattering noise, laughing, because he knows now that you've given in to your temptation and you've eaten his ghost food. And as you're eating that beautiful food, you find that what you thought was venison and fish and corn, all of a sudden you look and it's centipedes, worms, snakes, eels, slugs, and you spit it out, but it's too late. You gave in to temptation. You get up and you run, and all of a sudden you part the forest from up on a hill, and you look down and you see your vehicle or the smoke from your family's fires, and you think about that comfort and warmth that's there, and you close the bush and you run downhill towards what you saw. You're puffing and panting because you've run for hours and you haven't gotten to your vehicle or your home. And you part the bushes and you look and you realize that what you saw earlier is now further away. It's so hard for you to have, because you gave into that temptation that you couldn't get back to your comfort, your love, your family. And that's what Little Bukwus is all about. And I didn't cover that last night when I talked. So nowadays, no matter where you're from, and we're from east of the, or west of the Rockies, I'm from a different country, Canada, no matter where you're from, you're always going to have the bukwus around you. And you tell your kingdom on him, you tell your children to be wary of that bukwus. Because nowadays in this modern world, bukwus is all around us. It's called alcohol, tobacco, drug dealers. So you always tell them. You watch out for those lonely bukwus. They're out there. When they give you their wares and their goods to sample, you always turn and walk away. You never give in to temptation. So that's one of our stories about the Bukwus. So Peggy and I come from the Pacific Northwest, the land and the world of giants. You can walk through our cities, into our museums, our universities, into the towns of Vancouver, the city I mean, and throughout Vancouver Island, and you'll see giant cedar trees that were knocked down with chainsaws and carved into beautiful carvings of Chunakwa the wild woman of the woods, our female Sasquatch. It's the highest ranked crest in the Kwakwakiwak Nation. And just like someone might be able to afford a pickup truck, well, you know, you can buy a Ford F-150 or a used vehicle, and it works. It's got four wheels, it goes forward, reverse, it's got brakes and lights, but they go out and buy an Escalade instead, brand new. The reason why, it's because you're showing your wealth and power. And that's what these poles were all about and still are to this day. 
the families and their chieftains will get the artists like me to carve or these totem poles. I don't do big ones like this yet, but it's to display, to let you know that with outstretched arms, the power and wealth of that chief and his family are felt all around the world. So if you ever get the chance, come to the Pacific Northwest and you're gonna see these photos that you see here, the black and white carvings and that. You can go to our museums and see Chunokla carvings that used to grace our villages throughout the Pacific Northwest and especially my tribe's territory. And up in Alert Bay where I was born, you can see the graveyard where when a chief dies, uh, three years after his death, they hold a potlatch in his honor and they'll raise a memorial totem pole of many of his crests telling a story about that chief and his family, what crest they had title to, what wealth and status they were at. And when I was a kid, I used to walk by this graveyard and early evening I'd be scared because there was four poles with Junokwa standing there. And all I kept thinking about was, if you misbehave, the Junokwa, the Sasquatch, is gonna come grab you, shove you in her basket or her sack and carry you into the forest and boil you up and eat you. Because the Junokwa, the Sasquatch, is my tribe's boogeyman. And throughout our villages for thousands of years, those poles are standing. This one's in Kinkum, known as Kwai, deep up in one of the inlets. And there's about 100 people live in that village. And for over 20 years, I used to be a grizzly bear hunting guide. And I used to go up to that village to hunt grizzly bears with my clients for Safari Club International. And when we're up there, we were talking to some of the villagers about their Junokpa. And apparently, even in these modern times, the Junokpa comes right into the village at night. And they used to take food from some of the gardens. Nowadays, they say they'll come into their smoke houses and take the fish that they have hanging being smoked. <clears throat> and I've learned that from those people. But nowadays, in my investigations, I'm always asking Native Indians, what about your smoke houses? And no matter where I go, they all got stories about Sasquatches coming into their villages for fish. And they don't like the stuff that's too smoked. It's got to be the stuff that's only been in there for a day or two. So that's one of our traditional big houses in Campbell River. And on the front is the Sisu, the double-headed sea serpent painted across the front with the eagle, I believe. And then that pole standing is a welcoming pole of Junokpa. Even in a small city in modern times, we're still carving these Sasquatches and putting them all throughout our villages and our ceremonial homes because they're very sacred to us. That big pole there inside on the left left hand side there, that's the world's largest wood carving of a native Chunakwa, a Sasquatch. And when I go to the big ceremonies known as potlatches held by our families, I usually sit right in that corner there because I like looking at that big carving and seeing those beautiful masks and dancers come onto the floor. And in a building as big as this one, you can put your hand on the benches and you can feel them vibrating because the men are pounding on a hollow cedar log 30 feet long with wooden batons and they're making it sound like thunder as they're drumming. And in deep baritone song, they're singing the songs that go with the dances on that floor. The museums out west, they're just filled with the old and the modern Junokwa carvings. Even the rings like that copper and the silver one my cousin does, they're still sought after by collectors because nowadays with the show Finding Bigfoot, that has brought the attention of the Sasquatch Bigfoot front and center to the world, and especially North America, Canada, the US. A lot of people have approached we native Indians and they're asking us for our stories. And that's what I've been sharing on podcasts with Monster X Radio called Sasquatch Island, on my Facebook group, Sasquatch Island, West Germer's Sasquatch Chronicles and others. I'm telling them about how powerful it is to have a carving or a ring, or a bracelet, or a painting of the Junokwa, because it's displaying wealth and power within your family and your person. So nowadays, it's kind of working for in our favor as native artists, because everyone's ordering the Sasquatch carvings. And as you can see, my cousin's doing beautiful work with the rings that he makes. If anyone's interested, get, get a hold of me at the table, and I'll be happy to give you his contacts. For the people that weren't here last night, this is who I call Kodak. 
It's a carving of cedar wood, a mask that was carved in the 1880s from my village in Knights Inlet area off northeastern Vancouver Island. I call it Kodak because that ancestor of mine went out into the bush or the beaches and he came across a Sasquatch and he must have been pretty close because he went home and he took a chunk of wood and he carved that mask there, what he saw. I've seen Sasquatch a few times up close. To me, it's no big deal. Seeing a Sasquatch is like seeing a, black, a white black bear. You come to British Columbia and you go to three different places, the chances are you may see a white black bear. And they're not albinos, they're called Kermode black bears, they're white. Well, they're right out there, we know about them, they're scientifically proven. To me, that's what I look at Sasquatch Bigfoot as. It's a creature that's out there. And a lot of people who are skeptics, I tell them, go to the Museum of Anthropology at University of British Columbia and go take a look at Kodak. Because my ancestor in the 1880s didn't have a Kodak camera. He had to go home and carve it in wood. And to me, from seeing Sasquatches up close, this is what they look like like that carving right there my ancestor did. And for the skeptics, it's kind of a word that's come up today, talking about skeptics, family members, and so forth. People often ask me, why do you believe in Bigfoot? I said, because I lived in the bush for over 26 years. I know what's out there. I've even been to Omaha Indian Reserve in Nebraska and seen two Sasquatches that they call Sitonga and the Fleur Night Vision scope. And I know they exist. Well, they... They're not true. They're not out there. Otherwise, we'd have scientific proof. And I always look at them and I say to them, well, my ancestors have been carving and bringing to life in dance and song, Tunapa, male and female, the male and female Sasquatch. So the carvings and totem poles, welcoming poles, house posts, masks, stories, and dances. Are you telling me that my ancestors were pathological liars and full of BS? Because that's very disrespectful. And right away, I usually shut the skeptic up. So that's how I look at skepticism on Sasquatch Bigfoot. This slide here shows us Bukwus, that little small covered, covered in hair bipedal creature that is keeper of the ghost world. It's from the spiritual realm. And Peggy danced it on stage last night, as well as Junapa. And for the people that weren't here last night, we're here, we come all the way from across those Rockies, and Peggy likes getting in the outfit and dancing, so by all means, come over there, we can even go in the foyer out there while the speakers are up, I believe Bobo is next, and we can get you some pictures with it and demonstrate what those costumes look like on the stage when they're performed. And that's the favorite food of the Sasquatch out in my region, shellfish. So the picture shows you with the yellow baskets about 300 pounds of shellfish that was dug in under an hour. And in 10 minutes, I filled up that cooler full of shellfish called butter clams. So out there in British Columbia, when the tide goes low, we say that the buffet is out. You can go onto the beaches and eat shellfish, clams, mussels, barnacles, roll over rocks, and there's baby crabs and eels and little fish. And there's all kinds of foods out there. And this time of the year, from the end of salmon season in November through until about the beginning of March, Sasquatches are down at the sea level harvesting shellfish all through the winter. And when we dance the Junokwa, Peggy will put her hands in front of her face and she'll make a whooping noise. Because that's what the Sasquatches do at nighttime. They whoop from island to island, communicating to one another. This is March. When I leave here tomorrow, I have a few days off and then I have to go to Vancouver and jump on a commercial salmon seine boat, or a commercial herring boat. It's an 80 foot aluminum boat with five crew and we're going to go out and hopefully catch about 400 tons of herring that will come into the shallows and spawn. And all that green is the sperm, the milk for the males when the spawning is taking place in the shallows. Another couple of weeks from now when the spawns take place, starting in southern British Columbia and working its way up to southeast Alaska. It lasts for about a month and a half, the different spawns. The Sasquatches are going to walk in the water, in about a foot of water, and bend down, and they're going to pick up herring that are, some of them, almost a foot long, and fill their bellies in probably under half an hour. That's how much protein is out there, and that's why we have so many Sasquatch reports out in coastal British Columbia. In April, 
the glacier melt rivers at the heads of our inlets on the mainland will turn black with millions of these little fish called ooligans, the Campbell fish, the oil fish, that will come into those rivers to spawn. And once again, Sasquatches, humans, and other animals are going to feast on those ooligans throughout the first two, three weeks of April. And then in June, the salmon return. And uh, it'll be regionally all through the coast, but you can go to those rivers and it looks like that. Thousands of salmon and six inches of water spawning. And it's just immense amounts of protein. And shows you just, you know, how different our regions are. Out here, I'd probably starve to death in a couple of weeks because I don't know what to eat out here if I didn't have a gun. But out in British Columbia, as you can see, we have a lot of protein. And one of the things we have out there is very few humans. And that's why I believe that British Columbia and Nebraska will probably be the two places that come up with conclusive proof of the Sasquatch because we have so many. <clears throat> Another welcoming pool in one of our cities of Ajunokwa. And that's Ajunokwa with a misbehaving child in her basket that she's going to take away. That's actually Gunnar Monson's child from Monster X Radio and uh, Sasquatch Coffee. And then for you investigators, when in doubt, throw it out. That's what the late Dr. John Bendernagel, my good friend, taught me. So 1991, I believe it was, when I met him, and I did a lot of investigating with him, and he taught me a lot of things. But that one thing about when in doubt, throw it out. Number one, when someone videotapes something in snow, if they don't do a follow-up on tracks in the snow, throw it out. It's a bunch of BS because anyone knows that in snow conditions there will be tracks. I even looked outside. I see Bigfoot tracks outside this complex today when I got here. But this picture here is from Montana, and it's a supposed Sasquatch that was a guy took a picture of. But if it is, we'll notice, like my ancestors taught us, that the distance from the top of the lip to the bottom of the nose is pretty pronounced, just like Patty. And then the lips puckered up. You could tell if Patty was making a whooping noise, there'd be some big puckered lips on her. And that's what I always look at, as well as that ridge that, and that brow line. So when I see pictures on videos and that, where people approach me and they show me blurry pictures, if I don't see those characteristics, I usually say, thank you very much. And I, you know, excuse myself and leave. So we got to be very cautious of the people that are lying to us out there and just trying to get attention. And a lot of people that are members of Sasquatch Island, they know that I flush people. I kick people out of the group. I block them that get whiny and, you know, belligerent. And then I post the picture of the side their picture of a Sasquatch sitting on a toilet, meaning he got flushed. We have to be like that. I'm a captain of commercial fish boats, trained from a child, and made my way to the bridge of the same boat. I've been in logging camps with those tough men and women. And out there on the coast, in the seaweed camps and fish camps and the native people, the commercial fish boats, we don't put up with people whining and BS like that. And that's what we need to do in this community of Bigfoot Sasquatches. There's too many whiners out there. We've got to rid them from our community, and especially the ones that are belligerent skeptics. This is my personal opinion, but that's what I do. And here you've got the male Junokwa with the mustache. You will only see that mask performed in potlatches when a man has done all obligations and respect to a fallen chieftain, meaning he's held a potlatch, he spent well over $100,000 in one or two days of celebrating because they give gifts out to the hundreds of people that come to that potlatch and you would be amazed at what's given out. But that's when they put a mask with a mustache on that next chief to be, and that's called Chunaklis. It means he's done the rite of passage to become a chief. So all of our chieftains have all worn the male Sasquatch mask. A rare event, but definitely interesting to see. And we do expeditions. We bring people out to coastal British Columbia. We do expeditions out of Seattle, Washington State. We do everything from, I'll go out for, with a person for $150 for a 24-hour period in their vehicle, to putting 
chartering yachts and bringing people out into coastal British Columbia. We have what we call water taxis out on the coast. 12 passenger high speed aluminum boats with heaters, cabins, and the bathroom on board. So if you ever come out and you want to hopefully see our region and hopefully see or hear a Sasquatch, we can bring you on those water taxis to see giant trees like that, see those shellfish beds, big sea clams and other shellfish, well, cats, giant salmon, halibut, cod, whatever you want to experience. But for all of you here in Nebraska, please work together. Talk to each other today. Get each other's groups they belong to in Nebraska, because I know there's a couple groups in Facebook. And try to get up to Big Elk Park in Omaha Indian Reserve in Mason, Nebraska. And have a camp out and get that Indian. Lucas White, an Omaha tribe member, a good friend of ours, as well as an investigator. He's Tarzan. He ran away as a child from foster care and wasn't accepted into the community because people were afraid that the police and the child services would take their children away for harboring a runaway Indian child. So his family sort of shunned him, pushed him away. So from March until October, he lived in the bush in and around Mason, Nebraska. And when it got cold, he walked into town, the police picked him up, brought him to foster care, he stayed there, went to school. And when March came the following year, he ran away again until it got cold that October again. And that was his M.O. all through his childhood up until he was legal to be on his own at 18, I believe it was. But he's been close to the Sitonga. He knows about the Sitonga, their Sasquatch, Bigfoot, and Macy. And in Nebraska, when you go to Google Earth and look at Macy, Nebraska, up through Winnebago and Ho-Chunk to, towards Sioux City, you'll notice along the west side of the Missouri River that that Indian Reserve is the only enclave of your hardwood forest in heavy concentration. And from what I've seen with a pregnant female there, tracks I saw like that one and others in Macy when I was there two different times for three weeks and two years ago, they have a lot of Sutonga, a lot of Sasquatch in that Indian Reserve. Lucas, he uh, does guide work. I know there's two brothers out of there that I know that do their res squatching. I don't work with them. I don't, you know, network with them. But Lucas is available so that if you email me, I'll arrange it so he'll be at a gas station in Mason, Nebraska. You can pick him up, pay him a few dollars, and he'll take you out with a permit from the tribe that I arranged for him to get. And he has permission to break the 11 o'clock curfew at night where no tribe members are allowed out of, on the streets driving or anything. So from 11 o'clock at night until daylight, you've got that whole Indian reserve to do your investigating. And bring your slur, bring your listening device, and you're going to have an experience of the lifetime. And hopefully, hopefully Nebraska will come up spades and you'll get that conclusive proof that we need about Sasquatch Bigfoot so that we can start protecting more of our environment and those creatures. I'm a West Coast native artist, getting old, long in the tooth. We retired soon. When Peggy retires, I plan to do a lot of art to keep us, you know, a few dollars coming in. But if you are interested in my art, just go to the bigfootstore.com and get t-shirts and mugs and prints and other things. And if you want to know more about my investigations, my experience as a bushman for most of my life, being a commercial fisherman all my life, I've traveled the entire British Columbia coast and most of Alaska. And while I was there, I was always ridiculed because I was always asking too many questions. What's your Sasquatch stories? What do you know about Bigfoot? What's your native beliefs on it? What are your dances and songs about? You as a homesteader, a logger, a fisherman, what do you know about Bigfoot? So I've spent a lifetime, and I'm 53 now, always been interested in Sasquatch Bigfoot. And a lot of people wanted me to share those stories, and then Monster X Radio approached me and got me on board to do Sasquatch Island, the podcast. I also have a Facebook group. And the reason why I do it is to share what I have been just enthralled in, other people's stories and experiences about Sasquatch Bigfoot. So, Peggy and I, thank you very much for inviting us to Hastings, Nebraska, and in our language, Kalakiwesla. Go in peace. <laughs>